Today we're going to be responding to Doug Wilson, a Calvinist pastor who is also a iconoclast. Iconoclasts are against the veneration of icons, which is completely inconsistent because he accepts the Nicene Creed, which comes from the First Ecumenical Council at Nicaea. He accepts the normative authority of the church to give the Nicene Creed, to give the canon of scripture, but then he denies the rest of the normative authority of the church because we have the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which denied and condemned iconoclasm. It is a heresy, Wrong. but this is a problem is that Protestantism and Calvinism are a deviation from a deviation. If you look at the history of the church, the church was unified for a thousand years east and west until the Great Schism, when the West, the Roman Catholics, they added to the creed the filioque and they added these new doctrines of papal supremacy, uh, relying on forgeries. And it's kind of ironic because the Protestants claim to be against the, the Catholics, but they accept the filioque, which the Catholics added to the creed. The, versus the East, the Eastern Orthodox, we recite the Nicene Creed without the filioque. The Protestant position is completely inconsistent. They have an entirely new theology, and Calvinism is especially heretical and Nestorian. So let's see what he has to say. What is the reform response to Eastern Orthodoxy? Well, um, the it's really interesting when you look at uh, reformed uh, reformed Protestants and Roman Catholics. They're both part of the Western Church, and they have a great deal in common, such that it's possible for them to have an argument. Uh, you know, you can, uh, a Reformed theologian can argue with a Jesuit. Uh, it's much more difficult for Westerners, not just Protestants, but for Westerners, to get their minds around what's going on in East, Eastern Orthodoxy. It, He's right. One of the biggest errors in Western Christianity, Catholicism and Reformed theology, is focusing on Augustine alone, on one man, on one church father. Augustine was one of the greatest saints. But again, we don't put our entire faith on one church father. We have all these great church fathers in the West and in the East, and the Eastern church fathers are completely ignored. The Orthodox faith is built on the patristic consensus which means looking at the Eastern Fathers too, like St. Athanasius the Great, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, John Christendom, Maximus the Confessor, John Damascus, Simon the New Theologian, and Gregory of Palamas. And the entire Western Christianity is missing out on the knowledge of these great saints. To Protestants, to Evangelical Protestants, Eastern Orthodoxy looks a lot like Roman Catholicism because the worship is more ornate and, and ancient and the, you know that sort of thing. Um, but despite some of those similarities, there are some very different emphases and very different issues. And I think the divide between East and West is um, as, as profound and as big as the divide between Roman Catholics and, and Protestants. That's, so it's, it's, it'd be easy to, to fall into the trap of simplistic analysis and that sort of thing. I'm going to give him a lot of credit. He is completely right. There is a huge divide between orthodoxy and Catholicism. It isn't just Catholicism without the Pope. It is completely different. We have an entirely different theology. We have the essence energy distinction. We don't teach created grace or the filioque. We don't have, use unleavened bread. We have married priests. We have infant communion. We have theosis. We have cleansing the noose. All these things which are completely missed in Catholicism and Western Christianity. We are not the same. What would you say to a, to a family, particularly to a wife whose husband decides to go East, Eastern Orthodox? I would say, good job, welcome to the body of Christ. Well, um, the Bible, uh, uh, there are different layers. What should you do from ranging from, should I go with him? <clears throat> should I join the Eastern Church with him? Does, does my responsibility to be a submissive wife include that? to the other end, I'm divorcing him tomorrow because this wasn't what I signed up for. Um, a husband uh, a, a husband falling into doctrinal sin like that, and that's what it is. He's, he's backsliding, he's, a, he's falling away from the Reformed faith. Falling away from the Reformed faith? The Reformed faith is completely false. Wrong. No one taught Calvinism, no one taught sola fide or sola scriptura in the first 1500 years of Christianity. It is an entirely new invention. If someone leaves their reformed faith for the true orthodox faith, that is a great thing. So let's say that's the only thing. In, all, in other respects, he's a loving husband and father and he's continuing to provide and so forth. Um, a reformed wife ought, ought not even to think about divorce in such a circumstance. She should remain a dutiful, faithful wife and, and 
love him and submit to him. Um, but she must not go with him into the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church. A husband doesn't, ha- I'll just boil it down to a, a, a simple principle. Uh, going back to my earlier uh, um, answering of the, the question about images of Jesus. A husband doesn't have the authority to tell his wife that she must pray to an icon. This is where he shows his ignorance, and this is what a lot of Protestants do not understand. There is a difference between veneration and worship. Wrong. We are asking for their intercession, for asking them for to pray for us. Just like you asked your neighbor to pray for you, why can't we ask the saints? We know that they are in heaven. That's why they are saints. They have. We are all made in the image of God. We have lost that likeness, but the saints have restored the likeness and they are in heaven. So right here I have an icon of Saint Seraphim of Serov. And I am not worshiping this piece of wood. I am just, I, I have a lot of respect. So I have this picture. We'll, we'll sometimes kiss them just like you would a picture of a family member. It is not idolatry to do that. It is just venerating and showing respect. And I understand why there may be some confusion because in the original Greek, there's a difference between veneration and worship. It gets lost uh, in the translations. But we, we are not worshiping the piece of wood. We are not worshiping the saints. We are just asking them to pray for us. We are just showing respect for them because that's how we glorify God, by glorifying his saints. And this is what St. John Damascus said at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. I do not worship matter, but the creator of matter, who for my sake became material and designed to dwell in matter who through matter affected my salvation. The doctrine of the icon is tied to the Orthodox teaching that all of God's creation is redeemed and glorified, both spiritual and material idols. They are the exact opposite of idols because idolatry is when you worship created things, when you should be worshiping the uncreated. And that's what we worship, the uncreated energies of God. Icons are not idols, but symbols. Therefore, when an Orthodox venerates an icon, he is not guilty of adultery. He is not worshiping the symbol, but merely venerating it. Such veneration is not directed towards the wood or the paint or the stone, but towards the person depicted. Therefore, relative honor is shown to material objects, but worship is due to God alone, the uncreated God. Can you please address the idea that the Eastern Orthodox are the only true church because they alone can stake a claim on historical Christianity? I have a friend who recently converted, and I have heard that there are many uh, leaving evangelical churches for orthodoxy. I understand how compelling it is that they can trace their Christian heritage back to before Roman Catholicism and Reformed churches, and I cannot find a good resource addressing this issue. Okay, just a couple of things. Um, If you're talking about uh, the ancient lineage of churches and bishops and succession of bishops. The idea that Eastern Orthodoxy goes back before the Roman Catholic Church is just uh, laughable. It's, um, the Eastern and Western Church, uh, they were all together until they split in the 11th century. So that, that's, uh, that's simply historically uh, ignorant. But now, almost a thousand years after the Great Schism, we can see that Rome has continually innovated on the faith. 500 years after the Great Schism, there's the Protestant Reformation, which caused even more schism. Because schism causes more schism. And that's what the Roman Catholic did, is they broke off of the true faith. They are a second millennium church. The Orthodox are the only church that have a complete stake on history because we are unchanged. We are the church of the first millennium. We are ancient Christianity. The, the, the second thing is uh, the institutional church, whether it's in the West with Rome, or in the East with Orthodoxy is contrary to their claims, not an institution that has not changed over time. Uh, if you read the er- one of the things you read uh, uh, in the early fathers, the Epiphanius, who was the Bishop of Salamis, wrote a letter to Jerome describing how he was traveling and he, he came into a church and found an image, I think it was an image of Christ hanging up, and he tore it down, da- and he, the Bishop of Salamis tore it down because he said it's, uh, that, that doesn't belong in a Christian uh, sanctuary. That doesn't belong in a Christian setting. We don't base our faith on one quote line from one church father. We see what the church fathers taught, patristic consensus, the ecumenical councils in scripture. There is so much archeological evidence that they had icons in the early church and even before, even in the old covenant, there was iconography. So there, there were controver- controversies over a number of the issues that separate historic classic Protestants from 
Roman Catholics in the West and Eastern Orthodox in the East. Those controversies did not begin in the 16th century, um, uh, in, in the 16th century Reformation. Okay, but no one for the first 1500s of years of Christianity taught Calvinism. <gasps> no one taught sola scriptura, or sola fide, or any of these important Reformation doctrines. It was not present in the church of the first millennium. Well, what, what's happened, basically a lot of this contemporary debate is simply anachronistic. People are historically ignorant. They don't know what was. They don't know what the church was like in the second century. They don't know what it was like in the third century. They don't know what happened or the shift that happened at Second Nicaea. Oh, so we don't know, but we gotta follow him. We gotta follow Doug Wilson and join his business church in his new Calvinist theology. You're right. They they had it wrong at Second Nicaea, and there was just like a blackout period, I guess from uh, Second Nicaea Wrong. to the Protestant Reformation, over a thousand year blackout period where they were missing the most important doctrines of the Reformation. Come on, seriously, you think the church would err on theology for that long? That is a denial of Pentecost. Christ said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and that the church is a pillar and foundation of truth. What he's saying is completely wrong, it is heresy. Wrong. Just boil it all down. They pray through pictures. <laughs> the Bible says not to do that. So if someone bows down and prays in front of an image, a painting, a statue, a cross, uh, a consecrated piece of bread, if anybody prays to a creature, God says not to do that. And, so, and if someone says, well, this is historic Christianity, historic Christianity prays to idols, I'd say, well, then I don't want to be a historic Christian. <laughs> I don't want to be part of historic Christianity. They worship idols. We don't. I already clarified that. Read St. John Damascus. Read the Church Fathers. Read the Seventh Ecumenical Council. You can read Scripture. You know that Bible that you have? That came from the Church. Why do you accept the normative authority for the Church to give you the canon of Scripture, but ignore everything else? It is very clear. We do not worship the matter. We're not worshiping the piece of wood. We don't worship anything created. That would be idolatry. We don't. All we do is venerate and show respect for icons, for the saints. And it's just a picture. Jesus Christ is the icon of the Father. This is completely wrong. There's nothing wrong with the, mate with the material. And then we ask for their intercessions. We just ask them to pray for us, just like you ask your friend to pray for you, just like you ask your neighbor to pray for you. There is nothing wrong with this. This isn't an idolatry. This guy is just reiterating old iconoclast heresies. Now, that's a, the, the claim is false. Historic Christianity has... Uh, uh, consistently, historic faithful Christianity Wrong. has um, consistently stood against that uh, kind of thing and and faithfully. And the Reformation was a glorious cleansing of the church. Um, idolatry is one of the things prohibited in the Ten Commandments. Um, and it's just very simple. You go into the church and are there people praying to pictures? If there are people, if there are people praying to pictures, it's time to leave. Not praying to pictures. They're pictures of saints, of people we know in there in heaven. And we can ask those saints to pray for us. That is not idolatry. And what he is saying, if you hold his position that the reformers got it right, then you have to think that from Second Nicaea, like the, the mid uh, fourth century, to the mid 16th century, they were teaching incorrect doctrine. Because there was no Calvinists, there was no Protestants prior to the Reformation. You just, you just don't do that. Um, uh, I don't want the Lord to come again um, and, and have me bow, kneeling or bowing in front of uh, something that a man painted or carved or fashioned or wove or anything, anything like that. We aren't praying to pictures. They are icons of saints, saints that we know that are in heaven. We just ask them to intercede and pray for us. There is nothing wrong with that. That is not idolatry. And what he just said, okay, let's just say he's right. Then that means the church from Second Nicaea to the Protestant Reformations and John Calvin and, and Martin Luther, it took over a thousand years that they were allowing idolatry. It sounds like the gates would have prevailed against the church. See how this is a denial of Pentecost? Because this means if you hold his position, then you have to think that the church had significantly erred and was allowing idolatry for a thousand plus years, which is completely wrong, wrong. It's completely heretical. And if you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend 
Rock and Sand by Josiah Tremont. It is a great book. It is everything you ever need to know about Protestant versus Orthodoxy. And I recommend Catholics read it too. It's just a really great and easy to read book. But everything he just said is wrong. Comment below if there's any other Protestants you want me to debunk. I highly recommend watching Father Peter Heer's video on why we venerate icons. It's very simple on why we venerate icons. What, what this guy is saying and what Protestants say is completely wrong. It has no basis in history. It's an unintatable position. And this isn't even considering all the other heretical doctrines of Calvinists because this guy is a Calvinist. And Calvinists are basically Nestorians because they think they believe in penal substitution, uh, substitutionary atonement, which is completely heretical.